Well, um, let's uh, let's talk about features. And this is, in some ways, they're they're easier than options. In other ways, maybe a little more difficult. So, um, I'm going to try to explain as best I can uh, features and forwards and stuff like that. Kind of give an example. Um, example of the the farmers. That's what I'm going to start with. <coughs> farmers. So, um, you know, I give a lot of definitions in this lecture. Yeah. Uh, a futures contract is different than an option contract in a number of respects. And the most important respect is that the futures entails an obligation to buy or sell at a certain price. Remember with the option, if the price didn't go your way, you could walk away from the contract. So you just don't exercise. That's your option. That's why they're called options. The futures, you're agreeing to do something, and that's it. So let me first give you an example of a, a forward contract. And let's, let's talk about um, uh, an agricultural, I like agricultural examples, I guess they're um, where the futures market actually began 130 some odd years ago. So this is an example of a farmer, a corn farmer. And this farmer uh, can calculate quite easily uh, what the yield is expected to be. And we're going to assume away right now things like uh, crop disaster, or blight, or weather, or hurricane, whatever. Let's assume that away, and actually we can get insurance for those sorts of things. Okay, so either we assume it away, or we assume that we've insured it away. And let's say with a fair degree of certainty, we're going to have a million bushels of corn in the third week of September at the harvest time. Conveniently enough. And the farmer can do some calculations as to you know, what sort of price is going to deliver a, a crop. And suppose that the break-even is like $2 a bushel. And the price currently is $2.50 a bushel. And that's going to provide a, you know, a reasonable profit for the farmer. So the farmer's strategy is to either uh, do nothing, which means just like grow the corn and sell it in September. Let's say we're at the planting time, which I'm not even sure when that is. April? Very Okay. Uh, <laughs> so Iowa will probably be later, right? This will be frozen. Right. Um, so let's say, but let's say we're uh, in April or May and trying to decide what to do. We know for below two dollars we're in trouble. For above two dollars we're okay. So we can so-called let it ride and. Uh, Take whatever price the corn is at harvest. Got a million bushels, could be 250, could be higher, could be lower. Now the problem with that strategy of letting it ride is that what if the price is a dollar fifty? Well, potentially you're bankrupt. You can't pay your mortgage, you can't pay the uh, loan payments on your equipment. Uh, it could be a foreclosure. Or you know, like who knows what, you have to liquidate. So by not doing anything, just like grow, growing the crop and selling it on the cash market, you uh, run the risk of bankruptcy in a big way. The other possibility is for you to sell your crop today in April, sell it forward, which means that you agree to sell let's say for $2.50 a bushel, a million bushels a week, in the third week in September, and you agree to that today. Okay. And what happens? Well, suppose the, uh, the price goes down to a dollar. You're covered. You've agreed to sell at uh, $2.50. You're going to get $2.50. That's good. So in the bad scenario, you're covered. 
and uh, suppose the price goes to $5. What do you lose? You've actually agreed to sell at 250. <coughs> sell at 250. So from where you started, you lost nothing. Yes. Uh, as far as the delivery, uh, you were saying like you can get insurance if there's a blight or things like that. If I was a speculative investor, I was on the other end of the deal. Uh, just actually paying me the 250 is not really what I want. I want the actual corn because I'm predicting that the value of the corn is going to be four dollars in September. So if you receive insurance proceeds, the game you will not give me two fifty. I'm not really going to be as happy as if I got okay. an actual deal. Okay. Let's wait, okay? Because we, we haven't even talked about the speculator yet, or the other side of the house. Okay. But I'll get to that exact point. It's going you to understand how the forward contract works. The forward contract, you know, um, if it goes to a dollar, if it goes to five dollars. We get two fifty. If we didn't have that contract, then if it goes to a dollar, we're out, out of the game, bankrupt. If it goes to five dollars, that's great. You make a huge problem. So what the forward contract does is lock us in at two dollars and fifty cents. And it really, what it does is minimize the volatility. Volatility, by definition, is kind of the price minus what's expected squared. Well, uh, expect to get 250, you get 250. The volatility is very low. Zero in that case. So the first thing that's real important is that the farmer who uses the futures market or the forward market is actually reducing risk. Some people don't like <coughs> to use derivatives because they think that they're risky. The farmer might say, oh, you know, this derivatives, all I hear about is these big losses, so I don't want to be involved in that risky business. The first thing to realize is the risk comes when you don't use derivatives. So when you don't agree to sell at 250, then your risk is large because it could go to a dollar, your bankrupt could go higher, and you make some money. Yes. You mean, you mean to say that the farmer is misinterpreting the risk as he's taking on the risk versus the purchaser of the future who is really taking on the risk? Um, I, mean, I know what I mean to say is that the farmer really doesn't, in this example of the kind of naive farmer, um, the naive farmer doesn't understand risk, and that farmer doesn't understand forwards or futures either. It's pretty simple, I think, to see that if you lock in $2.50, that's a lot less risky than being a dollar or five dollars with whatever probability distribution. Okay, so that's all I'm saying. Now, we've heard both uh, people say, what about the other side? Who's on the other side? Who would want to agree to buy in September at two dollars and fifty cents? A million dollars. General Mills. That's right. Kellogg's. <coughs> so they're faced with kind of the opposite situation. That uh, if the price goes to a dollar, it's great for them. If price goes to ten dollars, it could be a disaster for the corn flakes. Especially if their competitors are. Um, are actively using the forwards and futures. So they are on the other side. They agree to buy a million bushels at 250. The price goes to a dollar. Well, too bad for them, but they're locked in at 250. It goes to ten dollars. That's great for them. They're locked in at 250. Okay, so in a way, what we've done is we put two risky positions together and eliminated the risk for both of them by using this forward cover. Yeah? Would the price of, would the price depend on the current price today, for example, if you're breaking it when it was $2, um, and you wanted something that was higher than that, what if the current price is a dollar fifty or something? Then your lock, the best you can do is to lock in a loss of a dollar, well, whatever it is, uh, 50 cents. So you use the 
you, I mean, it really depends on what the current price Absolutely, is. yeah. I, and if it is a dollar fifty, it's really bad news. I would uh, consider uh, planning something else, <laughs> right? If that's possible. Right? I think she's asking about the difference between futures prices and spot prices. Yes. Okay. Yeah. We'll see those differences also. But it could be a situation where all the futures prices are below uh, your profit point. But I mean, for something like corn, it could well be that the um, that the spot price is fairly high because you know we're in the middle of, of April. Well, let's say something other than corn, which because corn they have lots of stockpiles of. But if it's something that they don't have lots of stockpiles for, in April because of the seasonality it could be very high. Whereas in September, when everything is uh, you know, That's true. coming out, it could be cheaper. So it could be that the future rate is actually a lot lower. Than Absolutely. For a cyclical or seasonal commodities. Okay, well, uh, did you have a question? Um, what about futures? If the forward is a contract and the third week of September comes along and that's it. Okay, we do our, our contract. There's a number of differences with futures and Perhaps the most important difference is that the contract is rewritten every day. So let me try to explain that. <coughs> Let's say we start out and now forget the forward, we agree to sell um, a million bushels of corn the third week in September at $2.50 a bushel. And then suppose that the price drops to, let, let's say, um, a dollar dramatic uh, price shift, which wouldn't occur unless it was really good. <coughs> At the end of the day, the contract for the farmer is going to be rewritten. And the new contract says that you, in the third week of September, will deliver a million bushels of corn, and you're going to sell them for a dollar. That seems like kind of a bad deal, right? Because the day before, you had a contract to sell at two fifty, and all of a sudden, you've got a contract to sell at a dollar fifty. It's like you're out a million dollars. So the farmer would never just willingly do this. To get the farmer to rewrite the contract at a dollar bill. What we're going to do is to transfer a million dollars and drop it into his, uh, his bank account. So the farmer is agreeing to sell at a dollar fifty, but there's some compensation for it. And if we kind of ignore the interest uh, on the million dollars and suppose nothing else happens to the end of the contract, million bushels are sold for $1.50 and you've got a uh, million dollars in your bank account, the total amount $2.5 million, which is very similar, well the same in this example, to what happened with the forward. Okay, so the difference between the futures and forwards are that the contracts are rewritten every single day on Kellogg's side, Kellogg's is actually the, the party that transfers the million dollars through a central clearinghouse, and then it goes into the farmer's account. So Kellogg's is out a million dollars, but on the other side, they get to buy the corn at a dollar fifty. Their total outlay, two point five million dollars. It's the same. So this contract is rewritten every single day, and it might be it goes to a dollar fifty, then back to two fifty. So at the end of the day, the million dollars is transferred out of the farmer's account and back into Kellogg's account, and they're back at the two fifty, and uh, we we go another day. Yes. Isn't the buyer out of some money though? Because if you didn't have to pay the 250 until September, he could have been earning interest on that money. Where if it's if he has to transfer that million dollars on the second day, there, it is true that the interest rate is going to affect the actual futures prices. Okay. 
Okay, but for this example, let's just assume the interest rates are low or um, not a driving factor here. Because it might be that, like I said, that the million dollars was transferred into the farmer's account for one day. Right? The example I just gave, we went from 250 to 150 and then back up to 250. The interest on that's going to be small. But let's go to the next day. Okay, for your question. The next day. Next day, the price of corn in the futures jumps up to $3.50. And what is the farmer, what happens to the farmer? Well, the contract is rewritten. So the farmer gets the opportunity to sell at $3.50. And what does the farmer have to do for that? Transfer a million through the clearinghouse into Kellogg's account. So he has to transfer a million? Mm -hmm. The farmer. So basically what's happening, the farmer's getting a better deal. So instead of selling at $250, the contract's rewritten to sell at $350, but it costs a million dollars for that. But wasn't the contract rewritten to $1.50? Uh, that was the previous, two, two days previously. Right, and then I thought you said now the next day it jumps up to $350. No, let, let's, let's follow it again. So we start at $250. Uh -huh. The price goes down to $150. And a million dollars is transferred into the farmer's account. The next day, we jump back to 250. Okay, understand. Okay, a million dollars transferred uh, out. So we're back where we started. Mm -hmm. Then the day after that, we go to 350, and the farmer's going to shell out a million dollars to basically sell the, the corn at um, at 350. If nothing happens to the end, nothing happens to the end, then you get 3.5 million dollars for the corn but you paid this $1 million. So you're, as I say, ignoring interest rates at the $2.5 million that you started with. Any other question? Um, what, why would they do it this way, which seems more complicated than the, the forwards contract? And what's the advantage of this way? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. Do you want to answer? No, I just want to add to it. Yes. I mean, and it seems almost like you're selling at whatever spot price is. Oh, no, no, no. The, there is a difference between the spot price and the futures price. But if, if, if it's 350 today, and you, you're essentially selling at 350, then, I mean, why would you go through the whole problem of doing the futures of the forwards? Well, if you do not use the futures of the forwards, then you, as a farmer, are at great risk. The price could go to a dollar. If you don't do this locking in, then potentially you risk losing everything that you've got. So it's attractive to use the futures or forwards in that you're able to lock in a price. And that price is not necessarily going to be the same as the price that you could buy a bushel of corn today for. Okay, so if you look at the, the price that you're agreeing to sell today, which is like May, and you look at the price that you're agreeing to sell in September, that's not going to be the price of corn today. The price of corn can fluctuate day to day. It's the price that people determine is the fair price for September. Okay, but let me answer the question about uh, you know why would you want to do this? So it's like two parts to the answer. Um, the first part is like overall, there's a strong reason to do this, and that is to reduce the risk of the farmer. Okay. And I said that, well, what happens if the price goes to from 250 to 350? The farmer's going to come up with a million dollars? Where's that going to come from? The sale. The sale. It, well, but you're going to have to come up with it today. Where's that money going to come from? The bank. bank. Is the bank, bank going to be willing to do these uh, transfers for the farmer? Sure. Yes. yes. The bank likes this idea of hedging because it greatly reduces the risk of the farmer defaulting on the loan. Okay? So the bank might establish uh, some, some uh, funding whereby you can handle some of these day-to-day -day transfers because it greatly reduces the risk of the loan for the bank. Okay? Now, I still got to answer this question, why do we do it day by day? And it has to do the example that I've constructed for you is an example of the farmer in Kellogg's. It turns out if it was just the people that needed the corn or were 
producing the corn, trading in the market, it might lead to some problematic situations like Kellogg's and General Mills. You put them together and basically a monopoly power. Okay, so uh, what we want is speculators in the market too. Okay, so suppose you're a speculator and you think the price of corn is going to go up. Okay, so you see that in the futures it's trading for $2.50 a bushel. You really think uh, that it's going to go up to, um, to, you know, like $4 or something like that. And who knows what information that's based on. It could be a hunch. It could be, um, used to be a guy at, uh, at Chicago um, that drive out to the corn fields in Iowa on the weekend and pull over and go out to the fields and look at the corn uh, to see how it was doing. There's services that help you forecast this stuff, but, you know, whatever, uh, whatever, you believe the price is going to go up. So what are you going to do in the futures? You're to buy. You're going to buy at 250 And uh, suppose that this was a forward contract. So you agree to buy at 250. Now the idea with the forward contract, you've got this contract to buy at 250. Third week in September rolls along. You buy a million bushels for 250. And then if your forecast has come true and the corn is trading in the spot market for $4, immediately sell the corn in the market for $4 a bushel and you make $1.5 million. Nice profit. Suppose instead of the price going to $4, the price goes to $1. So you've got this contract where you've got to buy the corn at $2.50, you're going to sell it in the open market for $1, and you're going to take a loss of $1.5 million. You say, oh, forget that. I'm going to declare a personal bankruptcy. I know. What happened to the farmer? He's left hold of the bag. Yeah. So it's a uh, farmer got to sell for a dollar. Hedge didn't work because of the counterpart. So how can we avoid the situation of the speculator um, defaulting on the contract? And this is where um, you know one of the advantages of, of the futures comes up. So let's say that we start off the contract at 250, and the first day the price goes to three dollars. For the speculator, that's good news. The money is transferred into the speculator's account, five hundred thousand dollars. The next day, the price goes back down to 250, and five hundred thousand dollars transferred right back out of the speculator's account, into the farmer's account. Then the next day, the price goes to, um, say, $2. Now the speculator's really losing money. And it goes down, and the, um, the amount of transfers is $500,000. The speculator might say, well, this is enough. If I can't bear, like, another 10 cent loss, if that's the case, then I'm totally bankrupt. The speculator gets out of the contract. How do you get out of the contract in the futures? The speculator's got a contract to buy at a certain price the third week in, uh, in September. How can you get out of that? It's called a reversing trade where you agree basically to buy from yourself. No. Cancels everything. And because the price is being changed every day, it's exactly cancels everything. So you bail out at $2, you take your $500,000 loss, and that's it. Now actually, the way that it works, we're going to go through an example of how this actually works. The way that it works is that you have to post some good faith money both the farmer and the speculator, some margin money. And it might be the case that you're going to dip below kind of the minimum margin that you need to maintain. And if that's in, on this daily movement, 
and then you're going to be asked to post back up to the initial margin. And that's called, when you're asked, it's called a margin call. Margin call is always bad news. <laughs> <laughs> and if you cannot post back up to the margin, what is going to happen? They're going to reverse your trade and you're, and you're out. So one of the great things about the futures market is that it allows you to get in and out very quickly. It allows lots of speculators into the market. And it allows for kind of like one price that everybody can see. It allows for transacting at very low transactions costs. And it is just a, a great instrument uh, for, for hedging. It is also a great instrument for speculation. As we'll see. <coughs> so if I want to, uh, for example, if I want to buy um, a stock portfolio, I've got $500,000, and I want to buy something that looks like the S&P 500, I have no hope with $500,000 of buying 100 shares of the 500 securities that make up the S&P 500. That's going to cost way more. On top of that, to execute that trade could take two days. Because some of the stocks might not even trade in a day. The cost of doing that is, you know, uh, with the commissions and the bid-ask spread and whatever, it could be like 5% of your portfolio. Whereas the futures allows us to take a bet on the S&P 500 without ever touching the stock. And the actual transactions costs are a order of magnitude lower. So this is why they're very popular in schools. So let's let's look at a, a quotation. Um, let's go to uh, we talked about corn. Yeah. Bit of corn. This is a from August 1994 uh, quotation. And these are the contract months. September, December. Uh, and this is the opening price. This is in cents per bushel. This is the high during the day and the low during the day. And this is the settle price. Okay, so this is the price that money is transferred back and forth at. The settle is not necessarily the closing price or the last transaction price. Sometimes it's an average of the last couple of prices. Okay, but this is the most important price for us because this is the price whereby we're going to be um, changing um, money back and forth. The change, and note this, the change is not the change from the open to the settle. It's the change from the settle yesterday to the settle today. And it might be that, for example, September contract here, the open was 244. It went down to 243 and a half. So it looks like the change of a half. But it's only because the open and the settle yesterday were identical prices. So you'll see, let's try to find a, a counterexample of that. Uh, May. The open is 238. We, the settle is 237 and a quarter. It says down one. And that just means that yesterday's price was 238 and a quarter. And these are the uh, historical um, highs and lows for that contract. Uh, this is the open interest, which means the number of contracts outstanding. And as you get close to the actual end of the contract, the open interest almost always goes down. And the reason is that the speculators are kind of reversing out. Because they really don't want to take um, a million bushels of corn. Take, you, don't, you don't want to take the liberty of uh, everybody. <laughs> so you can just get out the day before or whenever by doing a reversing trade. Okay, and that's why the open interest decreases, and it actually decreases to the level of the people that actually have the corn and the people that actually want the liberty of the corn. <coughs> yes? So the reversing out of my understanding is <coughs> farmer sells you uh, you, and a, you as a speculator and a farmer have a futures contract. And when 
when you reverse out, the farmer's gotten the difference between the current futures price and the price that you originally signed the contract. We're not reversing the farmer's position. No, well, okay. we reversed out, and so the farmer now has nobody to contract with, so they can put another futures contract out. No. Uh, the actual way that it works is that uh, there's a, a middle uh, exchange. Right? So the farmer is not affected by this. The farmer is actually exchange puts all these people together. So you never know that the farmer's on the other side. There might be another speculator on the other side. And these contracts all look the same. Right? So these contracts uh, are September delivery. And just because you reverse out, there's somebody else that goes in the other way. Right? And if it's the case that everybody wants to reverse out, then it's just going to affect the final price. The price will change until somebody else comes in to take the other side. So the farmer has got a contract. That's it. There could be a thousand reversals on the other side. It doesn't make any difference. And the contract is guaranteed by the exchange. Ken? Yes. Yeah, I think legally, same, same way with options, I think legally each person the counterparty to their contract is the exchange, if I'm not mistaken. And what happens is that the exchange only takes on the contract. If you're buying, if you're, if you're selling, they'll only take on your contract if they find someone else who's buying. So essentially, there are two con contracts. There, there's you, there's you and the um, and the exchange, and there's exchange and someone else. So. And almost always, the other side is there. Because let's say you're buying, and there's nobody to sell. What's going to happen? Hmm? Price goes up. Price goes up, somebody sells. You're buying. So if you can offer a dollar uh, a bushel for the corn, nobody's going to sell it, obviously. Right? But as you go higher and higher, you're going to be able to transact. But the exchange plays this middle role. It's very important. It provides the guarantee, it provides the liquidity, and it puts everybody together. Sort of just thinking about the mechanics of it. If I have five hundred thousand, and I think I want to speculate, the corn's going to go up. There's this cash flow that's going back and forth. How do I know what my initial investment has to be so that I've got cash left over to cover these flows? Uh, we have to go through an example. Okay, we've got an example in the lecture note that shows, you know, all the cash flows. Yeah. In your example, would you expect kind of how long is going to be the final purchaser? Yes. That's, that's a little bit Well, it could be a storage company. Yeah, exactly. You know, uh, yeah, whoever's going to actually and use it more. Not than necessarily that. just Kellogg's. Like, corn is used for like, oil and, uh, and sugar, whatever. Yes? Back to the margin accounts, the money that you put up at, at front. Does the money really flow back and forth every day it does. between those mm -hmm. banks? Absolutely. It right. seems like huge transaction no, costs. It's all it's, huge. It's not. It's all uh, computer transfers. And is it between the exchange and the farmer, or is it between the farmer and the speculator? Uh, it's handled, uh, I guess there's, uh, well, your broker will have an account. And um, you really, actually, what people do is uh, just establish a money market, uh, an account with your broker, right? So even the margin money, you can be getting interest let them handle all the transfers, right? So there'd be some net transfer every day, just let them handle it. Yeah, same thing. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah, well, there's always the transfer, but you can have a money market account is basically like a T-bill, right? Well, if you have a T-bill, they're not giving the money. They're not giving the transfers. If you're winning, there's no, there's right. the transfer is so no only into your account. Well, there is there is an actual dollar, as far as I understand it, uh, with uh, my experience, there's actually dollars of transfer. Like, it's like every day we settle a month of terms. Like you can post margin in many different ways, but let, if we do an example, I think we're fine. I used to work at Morgan Stanley and we had clients who did that. And that's, as their broker, we would hold their money market in one section of Morgan Stanley, but every morning I would either receive a wire from a different department or send the wire. So I actually had to redeem the money market, which was a portfolio of T-bills, to get 
to make that transfer. Right, from the client side, there's no transfer. The client wasn't doing anything, but I had his money. I mean, I had control. Right. Of, That's what I'm saying. Right, but so otherwise he would be. The client wasn't doing anything. Yeah, this is the client's not doing anything, but the client money is being affected. We actually right? we had a client that we, the client can request to be called every day and do the wire himself. That's right. But we had somebody default on like ninety thousand dollars of just that still to this day. Yeah. But that's, you know, a uh, small change. For right, but for, for an individual. <laughs> yeah. 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 He wasn't happy. Yeah. Okay, well, let's, uh, <laughs> let's uh, do an example um, that hopefully will help us see what happens. There's a lot of supplementary material in this lecture, um, like the basis risk and stuff like that, <coughs> that even more in the second year course. So um, this is the example I want to go through. It's called uh, basically uh, buying the treasury bond. It's a historical example of um, when the treasury bond price was incredibly low. And basically what we're going to do is to set up a position we're going to have an initial margin of $4,000. And that means we're going to have to deposit $4,000 into a margin account. We're going to agree to buy one treasury bond in June 1981. The price in the futures is 6703 and that's where we start. Okay, so what I want to do is kind of follow uh, the cash flows. The treasury bond is a $100,000 bond, but it's quoted in terms of $100. So you'd have to multiply everything by 1,000 to get these cash flows correct. Okay, so let's see what happens to this investment. And we start out the second, the, well, we start out on the first. And the first day that we're actually in the market, the price drops. And you think about this, 6703 for a price of an 8% coupon bond with 15 years to go. What's the interest rate? Hmm? Approximately? Yeah, something like that. It's real high, 14, 15% compared to what we have now. So it's like you're taking a bet in the market that rates are going to go up or rates are going to go down. Rates will go down, the bond will go up. So that's why we're a long position. And, uh, you know, I wasn't obviously trading in, um, in April of 1981, but if I could reel back to that time, um, <laughs> this is a pretty reasonable uh, trade, right? Rates are at an all time high. We haven't seen rates since uh, they had treasure bonds like this. We're in an all-time high of uh, 15 or 14 percent, and you agree to buy. We know if the, what happens if the rate goes to 8 percent? What happens to the price? Goes to what? Okay. Well, let's let's follow this. Well, uh, unfortunately, the first day the price goes down, which means rates went up again. We lose $840. That means our margin account uh, is reduced uh, to 3160 And there's going to be a threshold level called the maintenance margin. And if we go below that maintenance margin, then we're going to get the margin call. The maintenance margin in this example is $3,000. So as soon as we go below $3,000, we get the call, and we have to post back up to $4,000. We're not there yet, so we just take this loss. And uh, the next day, the price drops again. And the price drop multiplied by 1,000 is negative 630. Our account balance drops to $2,530. We're below the maintenance margin. We get a call. Post. $1,470 to bring yourself up to $4,000, or we're going to reverse. And you do that. So you transfer in uh, 
1470, bring the account balance up to 4000. The next day is a bad day. Um, bond drops a huge amount and you lose $1720. $1720 uh, takes you again below the 3000, you get a margin call again. What, two days in a row of margin calls. Very, very bad. <laughs> so you have to post again up to $4,000. And notice what's happening here. Um, in the very last column, I keep track of the total profit or loss. The total profit, uh, well, it's not a profit, it's a loss, is 3190 and what we've actually put up is like we started with four thousand dollars. We lost three thousand one hundred ninety in three days. So almost our entire investment has been wiped out in three days. Now, if we were doing options and we had spent four thousand dollars on call options, right? How much can we lose? These contracts have no cost. And how much can we lose? Well, everything to me is like the initial investment. I think everything to you means like not just the initial investment, but house, whatever. <laughs> house and kit. Um, so it's uh, yeah, basically unlimited on the dam. Or sixty seven thousand. Yeah, price is that's the limit in this case. How far can it go down? Yeah. But it's uh, it could be the case that we've got more than one contract here. Yep. So let's follow it. The day after that, uh, the price goes up, and that's a good day. And uh, thirteen hundred is transferred into your account. And notice the account balance goes well above four thousand to five thousand five hundred forty. And yes, you can pull some of that money out if you're only required to have four thousand. But this person uh, decides to let it go, and you see some positives and some negatives, and you actually see more negatives than positives. Then you get uh, these really bad days here, um, which are like the all-time low of the Treasury bond, where you thought 67 was cheap. 59? Really cheap. So, and you've had to make two more uh, deposits here, seventeen hundred and twenty-one fifty. And by the time we end this all off, we get some recovery to sixty-four seventy-five. But overall, you lose two thousand uh, three hundred dollars. So this runs over a month and a half, or something like that. Four thousand dollars you put in, and uh, the loss is uh, twenty-three hundred. What if you were on the other side? How would you change this table? So instead of agreeing to buy, you agreed to sell? Yeah, it's real easy. Just the global substitution. And every plus is a minus, and every minus is a plus. It's very symmetric. So this is basically how this works. Now, this is a situation where you put um, a margin, the minimum possible margin. Or four thousand dollars. Now, in the lecture uh, note at the back, I've got um, the margins. And can you flip to that if you've got it uh, under interest rates?
if you're just going to get the upside and you don't bear the downside, that's going to be costly. You have to pay for that. There's money actually going out for that. There's a premium. That's like insurance. But is that premium usually the same value as losing everything? That's wrong. It's a trade off, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, like in the option, you get the upside and you're limited on the downside. In the futures, you get the upside, the same as the option, but you can lose on the downside. So, the premium for the option is exactly the compensation for not taking that downside. Exactly how it's defined. So, you know, it depends on your taste. You want options fun. It just seems like you have to have a lot more money to play these and expose the options. Let's go to the, uh, the margin and take a look. So, um, somebody have the interest rates? So what I want you to use for the assignment is the XYZ rates. XYZ is a prominent uh, house on uh, Wall Street. Uh, and the I is the initial margin. And I is 28.36 for the bond, the T bond, which is what we're looking at now. And the M is the maintenance margin, and that is uh, 2100. So the numbers I used in my example were 4000 and 3000. It's 28.36 and 2100. Um, notice below that, um, in, in the middle, it says X min. That's the exchange minimum uh, margins, which are, are lower in this case. And that just means that uh, there's no way you can get the deal better than that. Uh, to, to the left is uh, hedge, I, and M. <coughs> and notice those are lower, 1750 and 1750. And that just means that if you've got a combination position, like the treasury bond and then, let's say, the euro dollar at the same time, one long, one short, then that reduces the overall uh, margin that's necessary. Now, how do you think these margins are set? Yeah, it's like what you're trying to do is to guarantee that nobody defaults, right? So you'd like a situation where the bond price isn't going to move sufficiently to, to move, like, let's say, plus or minus $4,000. Because you know, if you go, let's say, $4,500, it might induce some people into defaulting on the contract. So the, the margin actually reflects the volatility of the underlying asset. Okay. Yes? There are um, two other responses about, about, about the, um, you know, the amount of loss that you can take on, too, I think that should be kept in mind. One is that when you go into the trade, you can tell your broker, get me out of here if I lose $4,000 and basically put in a, um, a reverse trade that kicks in automatically at a certain price level. So in one sense, you would limit your, your loss. The difference between that and a, and a call, though, is that the call, you, you know, you can kind of, if it goes below that, it comes back up, you still, you're still in the market, whereas with this, you're, you're out of it. And the second thing is that um, I think all futures markets have a limit set each day for how much how much they'll allow the trade, the trading to go up and down, so that if there's a, a huge trade, a huge change in the value of the underlying security, they essentially stop trading at, at a certain level, which also limits your daily loss. And it, it turns out that most of the limit moves have been removed. Have they? Yeah. And uh, so this is the idea that if you go a certain amount, then trading basically stops. And uh, the problem. You know, the limit move doesn't necessarily protect you, whereas you can't get out at the, at when they slow. Well, it only protects you if there's a sort of, um, you know, like overnight, overnight people come back to their senses, you know, and the, and the market kind of moves back. Exactly. But that's often not the case, that you go limit after the first hour, and then the next day you go limit after the first two minutes. When do they get rid of price? Well, it depends on the actual contract, but uh, there's no limit moves on your major contract. So 95% of the volume of trading is without limits. There's some limits on some currencies that I think were recently removed, but they were almost never uh, kicked in. So, yes. What portion of volatility uh, is the margin? Is it some standard deviation? Um, 
It's actually in the assignment it says something like five to eight times uh, margin is the dollar volatility. And it depends. Let's, uh, let's see if uh, that actually makes sense. Let's look at another contract. Um, and this is the one that we looked at in assignment number uh, one. Euro dollar. And this is really a deep, deep contract in terms of uh, trading. So it goes all the way up to, uh, this is not in the, the lecture notes, it's just it, today's one. It's yesterday, so it won't be sure. I don't get into the journal before I get into the class uh, at eight. So notice that uh, this goes out all the way to September 2005. And I want you to look at the, uh, the open interest. The open interest for the December contract, 357,952. And notice that the value of the contract is $1 million. So what's outstanding for that one contract is 357,000 times a million. That's 357 billion. That's, that's a lot of value. And that's, that's just, one, just one. To give you some perspective on this, uh, the NYSE trading volume in any day, six billion dollars. The trading volume here, 327 billion dollars. And I guess that just that one contract, the December uh, 1995 contract, has got much more dollar volume than you know, stock exchange. Just one Euro dollar put together, it's got more volume than all the stock exchanges in the world put together. Well, you never hear in the radio and the euro dollar uh, moved up by uh, one point. So, this is just a hugely popular uh, contract. And it's staggering, in my opinion, just the, just the, amount of, um, the amount of trading that goes on on this one contract in terms of the underlying value. Yes? What I was in Europe this summer, I never saw a euro dollar. <laughs> what, what is a euro dollar? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> the lecture on financial instruments. Um, uh, what it is is it's like a, you know what a CD is in the U.S. Um, Ninety-day CD you get it at your bank. Um, all it is is the same thing, except in a London bank. So it's a certificate of deposit in U.S. dollars in a London bank. That's where this is quoted from. So they actually survey uh, a number of banks to get their, their CD rate in U.S. dollars. So that's a euro dollar. A euro dollar generally means uh, a CD dollar deposit outside the U.S. It doesn't have to be in Europe. It just so happens that this contract that everything's out of London. Okay, so it could be in the Caribbean. They call it the euro dollar deposit. And it doesn't have to be dollars either. So it could be euro mark deposit. And that might be uh, Deutsche Mark deposit in the US. Or euro pound, whatever. Okay, so it's just like outside your country in, uh, in, in whatever uh, currency. And this is a very important market. There's a euro bond market also, which is just the dollar bond market outside the US. No, no, that, that's actually uh, still around. So um, that's actually going to happen. Yeah, that's uh, notice that that's a good question, and I don't really have the answer to it. Other than, other than notice that all the contracts are. March, June, September, December. Everyone. And then there's this one January stuck up there. January 1996. And it's got fairly low open interest. So, um, actually, don't know where it came from. Uh, it's just there. And maybe 
So you could do a, like an in-between three-month contract now and then. But usually, if actually you go to the uh, the bitmap uh, on the web, uh, nothing like that. Yeah, it's much lower open interest. Nevertheless, uh, it's a very substantial open interest. Other contracts would love to have open interest like that, but it's just much lower. And you know, notice if you were to stare at this, there's some strange uh, price movements. Notice that almost everything moves up a point, except for one. And there's one of them that goes up. Yes. So that's and then so on the other side, you have two that are down 10 basis points. And you. Uh, Un under you, two columns to the right. Yeah, I see that. Uh, right here. Right, and yeah. the bottom one. Yeah, right there. So, you know, it might be that when we get way up, that there's really not that much trading volume on these, but the trading volume is really concentrated at the top. Um, so, it might be some strange things. And again, um, you know, these are all the settled prices, so. Notice that they're fairly symmetrically affected too. So what's the, the margin on, on this account? Oh, pardon. I just want to ask me, uh, Euro dollar is a popular measure just because that's where the um, interbank currency exchange is. And so well, London is the financial center. Yeah, yeah, just because it's there and that's why we go to Euro dollar because that's the biggest market for money. So yeah, the that's biggest, one that you look at rather than London is your first place. choice. Yeah. If you're looking for jobs, I would look to London. Uh, Often the students ignore um, London, but it's just a great financial center. And a lot of firms are offshore. The trading in dollars in London is just huge. Okay, and this is a benchmark um, it's a benchmark interest rate that's uh, sometimes often referred to also as the London Interbank Offer Rate. It's a LIBOR. Okay, and that's just linked to Euro dollar deposits. And you can get a euro dollar for whatever, 30 days, 60, 90, 120, up to five years. <coughs> so this, this is just for a 90 day, but you can get different maturities, and, but it's not traded on the futures. Yeah, you said it's individuals or institutions? Or oh, what? I mean, just like your assignment number one, you've got some cash flows. Ideally, what you'd like to do is to discount them by zero coupon bonds, because that works exactly. And what they do is just use these uh, forward interest rates and uh, do exactly what you did in assignment number one. Like I really mean exactly. Here are the cash flows, here's the page, do it. Okay, so this is very popular. So if you've got something that's very complicated, you know, kind of you structure the cash flows in a certain way, you want to hedge it, um, here are all the interest rates where you can replicate the portfolio. For sure. Yeah. Would a one cent gain or a one cent change here translate to ten thousand dollars your gain or loss? Is that how you read? No. Uh, in this particular contract, I think one cent is like twenty five or point zero one is like twenty five dollars. Yeah, you have to work it out in terms of the um, yeah twenty five for a one point move. So this is not this is uh, you have to work it out because this is quoted on an annual basis, but it's a ninety day uh, CD. So you have to adjust for that. Okay. Yes. It's a very practical question. If if we have a cash flow that's coming in on March and on the end of February '96, what's the rule of thumb about looking at January or March as our discount number? Round up, round up. Oh well, you always want to go back because this is uh you want the rate that's relevant to bring it back. So if I've got a cash flow that is going to come in. Uh, the third week in March, right? And the rate that's relevant is not the rate in the third week of March to the third week in June, but the rate from whatever it is, December to March. Right? To bring back the present value. December means March. Yeah, and what this contract just says is that you're going to buy or sell a 90-day euro dollar deposit and that happens in the third week of March. The third week of March, you get that deposit, and then it lasts for 90 days. So you think of it as a treasure zone. You know, take the delivery of a treasure zone. It's a, it's a strange thing. It's easier, I think, to think about corn. 
right? Or then the financial instrument. So it's really the same thing. Yes? Would this be an instrument that you would use to hedge against foreign currency? Uh, if I wanted to hedge against foreign currency, I'd probably go directly to the currency features. So, which are available. So that would uh, allow me to lock in an exchange rate. So I've got some cash flow that's coming in, um, in September and in Deutsche Bank, let's say. And then uh, I want to lock in the conversion rate today. So I can do that. Good. Yeah. Uh, there are people who have um, floating rate loans that are, are based on, um, on these interest rates. So it's something that you might use to hedge against those. Oh, yeah, it's like uh, that you agree today to uh, purchase, um, think of this as a, like a, a treasury bill or something like that, to purchase a treasury bill in the third week of March for 94.64. Okay. Now, the actual price is not 94.64 because that's based upon an annual Thing, and this is only a 90 day rate. <coughs> okay? So the interest rate implicit in the 94.64 is 5.36%. So really what we want to do is to calculate it based upon 5.36 divided by 4. Okay? So that means the third week of March, you're going to pay uh, whatever the adjusted price is, 94.64, and then three months later, you collect the, the power amount. That's what's going on. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay, well, uh, what's the margin for the year dollar? The receipt with the margin here? XYZ margin? It's seven. We could calculate it, and if we were doing this for real, 
definitely document. But believe me, it's set for this exam. So the Treasury bond is 28 times more sensitive to the interest rate than the euro note. And it basically, that means it's 28 times more volatile. Now, these numbers make sense. The euro dollar uh, is 810 initial margin. The T bond is 28 times more volatile. So just as a kind of a rough thing, we could multiply 810 times 28. Again, I can't do that. Um, what is can we get the calculator? 28 times 810. $24,000. $22,000. Now, is the T bond initial of 2836 reasonable? I heard one no. The trick question as usual. Uh, reasonable assuming that numbers were very approximate. 24,000 to 2800 is not approximate, right? That's a huge difference. What's going on? Yeah, yeah, the euro dollar is a $1 million uh, underlying asset, whereas the treasure bond is $100,000. So if we put them on the same basis, then uh, the T bond would be like $28,000. And we're in the ballpark. That's, that's approximately 24000 28000 given the guest on the modified duration of seven. It's pretty close. So the volatility really does determine uh, the differences in the, uh, uh, the margins. And you'll notice that if you actually do the S&P 500, that it's got a pretty high margin compared to the value. And that's because it is very volatile uh, compared to uh, an interest rate uh, or, you know, your, your dollar. Yeah. Is that why exchange has changed the interest margin of Yes, yes. So after the October crash of 87, obviously the margin for the S&P went up dramatically. Because they you know, took some hits there. So they, did they readjust that like every quarter or whatever? Yeah, it depends. Yeah. It depends when they decide to do it. Uh, there's no uh, quarterly review so of our margins. Okay. But it will move, it will follow uh, what happens in terms of volatility. OK, well, let's uh, get time for a break. Uh, we'll come back and do some thinking and things. Ten minutes. Then I'll talk a bit about some hedging examples. <coughs> Suppose that what you do is not put four thousand dollars in a margin account, but you actually put hundred percent of the value of the underlying contract into a money market account. So a lot of uh, brokers will allow you to do this. So you just establish a money market account with them. And you can uh, choose whatever uh, to put in. And you'll get the money market interest rate on that account. So in a way, it's kind of like a margin account that's bearing interest. What I'm, what I'm going to do is what I call a 100% margin situation. So let's do that. And the bond was initially trading for $67,030. I'm going to deposit $67,030 into the money market account. And then take uh, one long position in the treasury bond and hold it. Calculate my portfolio return is just the interest rate times $67,030 plus the percentage change in the futures price times the initial uh, value of the futures contract, 67030 divide by the initial value of what I deposited in the money market account. And I get the formula for the return on my portfolio, which consists of a money market deposit and a long futures contract. And the return is just the interest rate plus the percentage change in the futures price. In this situation, there could not be a margin call because you've got $67,030 in margin. 
the only way there could be a margin call is if the bond price dropped below $3,000. Extremely low. Well, I guess I was just thinking about the prior, prior example of you know, the corn. You kept putting more money in if you're trying to copy a return there. Right. Okay, so <coughs> what you're saying is that this 67000 will not be 67000 for the whole contract. It's going to go up, it's going to go down. It's going to be close, you know, um, to R. Yeah, that's a good point. If nothing happens to the end, then it's basically R. So we're going to get an interest rate component and we're going to get the percentage change in the futures price. Now what I want to do is to change the leverage. And now what I'm going to do is, is instead of putting $67,030 in, I'm going to put $20,000 in the money market deposit. And the way to calculate the leverage factor is to divide the assets control by the equity employed, and that's the actual cash that you're using, transferred out of some other thing <coughs> to this money market account. The leverage factor here is 3.35. And we can recalculate how this affects the portfolio return. Again, we've got $20,000 times the interest rate. And again, this uh, it's going to fluctuate depending <coughs> on the transferring in and out of the account. But let's just uh, simplify it to be $20,000 times the interest rate times 67030 which is the initial price of the bond, times the percentage change in the futures price, and divide by what we've actually put in, $20,000. So this means that the portfolio return is the interest rate, but now we're taking the futures price change and multiplying by the leverage factor. So, this is kind of the lesson of this exercise. That if we execute a transaction like this, put <coughs> 100% of the value of the underlying asset in the money market account, the volatility of that position is very much similar to the volatility of the underlying asset. So doing this type of trade where you take money market deposit and one long futures contract is very much like just buying the bond and holding it. You buy the bond, it costs 67030 There's some volatility. Or you put it in the money market and take the percentage change in the futures price. Very similar volatility to those two types of transactions. And that's kind of what I was saying, where you could use the S&P 500 instead of the underlying stocks. So one possibility, you've got $500,000 and you can try to buy um, a representative portfolio, not 500 stocks, maybe 50, that kind of represents the S&P 500. And you can hold that. And that's got some volatility. You can return every day and you can hit the button in Excel to get your standard deviation. The other possibility is to take your 500000 drop it into a money market account, and take a long futures position in the S&P 500. There's two components to the return. You get an interest rate component, and you're going to get a percentage change in the futures price. Okay. It turns out that that has very similar volatility if you actually bought the stocks. If you bought the stocks, you'd have two components also. You'd have a dividend component, and you'd have a capital gain component. Those two things would equal a return. And actually, the only difference, really, is uh, that on one hand, we've got R for an interest rate, and on the other hand, we've got D for a dividend. And those things don't move that much. So when you calculate volatility, the volatility to position is very similar. So to use the futures with 100% margin is very similar to transacting in the underlying asset. It's no less, it's no less risky, it's no more risky. And so people that say, well, I don't want to use futures because they're too risky. Well, that makes an assumption about the degree of leverage that you're employing. So it is true that the futures are riskier if you employ leverage. So if we go down here, 
this is definitely more risky. So if the futures price goes down by 10%, and our leverage factor is 3.35, then we face a loss of 33.5%. Okay, so the leverage is going to magnify the size of the returns up and down. <coughs> And this is with a leverage factor of 3.35. Example that I did with that chart was an example where the equity employed was $4,000. The leverage factor there is like 12. Okay. Now, 12 could really cause some volatility. And we saw it after three days, we're down 75%. After the two months, we're down 50%. Annualize that in terms of volatility. Well over 100% volatility. So uh, it turns out that there's a direct relation between volatility and leverage. And basically, the, the volatility, the return on your equity, is just the leverage times the volatility of the change in the futures price. So if this L equals 0, then the volatility, or equals one, if L equals one, then the volatility of the S&P 500 stock futures plus the money market is basically equal to the volatility of the cash, or holding the individual stocks. But as soon as we move this leverage up, move it to two, we double the volatility. If we move it to 10, we move it by an order of magnitude. So the lesson here is that if you're going to go in to the euro dollar contract with $810, that's going to be an extremely volatile situation for you. Because you're using a lot of leverage. What's a million divided by 810? The leverage factor is massive. Okay, so in the lecture note, I kind of make this recommendation that you know, you really have to know what you're getting into here. Okay. If you go in just with the, the minimum margin, then you're getting an extremely volatile, um, you know, asset return. But it need not to be, it need not be that volatile. That, in fact, it's not <coughs> the derivative market, it's not the futures that's causing the volatility. It's you. But you, personally, are setting the leverage. So it, it makes no sense to me to blame the derivative market for volatility. If you lose everything, it's because you've employed leverage. So you set the risk. So somebody said, well, futures seem riskier than options. You know, I guess it depends on your view of risk. It depends on what your leverage is. It depends on, you know, the option is different, right? It's got no downside. So maybe you want to weigh that into your, um, your you know, assessment of risk also. But the bottom line is that the futures need not be riskier. It just depends on the amount of leverage that you actually uh, can apply. And I think that's an important uh, lesson. Um, the basis risk stuff you can Skip, read at your leisure. Um, I'm sure you don't have much leisure time. Um, this is just a graph of the call and the put against the <coughs> futures. So the call option payoff is not a long futures payoff. Hopefully, everybody can see that. So the call is truncated if the price goes down, and the futures. There's no truncation. When the price goes down, you lose if you're long. Yes? Why didn't you set that down by the amount of premium? I could, yeah. So this is kind of like the gross payoff of the call. So I can do this. No, you could do that. <laughs> um, short features is not a put option. It looks like a put option only if the price goes down, but the put option, if the price goes up, you kind of walk away. If the price goes up to the short futures, then you're losing. You're losing if you're speculating. Okay, that's important. 
first one is a bank that's got uh, $500 million in government securities. And it's the beginning of the year. The investment committee expects that the interest rates are going to rise within the next couple of months and then level off afterwards. So what's the risk? What happens if the interest rate goes up? As the bond price goes down. So you are in charge of putting out the hedge. So the first thing that you do in setting up a hedge is you establish what the bad scenario is. We did this uh, earlier with options, kind of write um, you know, what happens for a 1% move <coughs> interest rates in the wrong direction. So for us, interest rates going up is bad news. It's going to decrease the value of this $500 million portfolio. So what sort of position in the futures market is going to pay off if interest rates go up? Translated, somebody said put in the futures market. Short futures. So when the interest rates go up, prices go down. And any time prices go down, to, to get a positive payoff from that, you have to be short the futures or sell the futures. If this was an option, we'd be doing a put option on the price. Or call option on the rate. Okay, so that's the first thing you've got to establish is the, the direction. But that's the most important thing to establish is direction. The next thing is to establish the size of the position. And actually, in between, is establish the appropriate instrument to hedge with. And we're given some in extra information here. It says that the bank is holding 8% coupon treasury bonds with 20 years to maturity. It's very convenient. Because it just so happens that in the futures market, we have a contract on a bond that's 15 to 20 years maturity with an 8% coupon. So it is immediate uh, what to use. And if we had a 30-year bond, we'd probably use the same contract. If we had a one-year bond, then we'd probably go to the euro dollar or the treasury bill. So you always like to match in the futures as close as possible to what you try to hedge. Okay? In this stylized example, I set it up so that I've got the same instrument in my portfolio that is in the futures market, basically. And everything's trading at par. The value of the treasury bond in the futures is $100,000. I've got $500 million to hedge. What's the transaction? The sale, and the number of contracts is just going to be the value of what I'm trying to hedge, $500 million, <coughs> divide by the value of the contract, which happens to be $100,000. Now, very important, so I said value and value. I didn't say par and par or face and face. I'm talking about value, the market value. In this example, everything is trading at par. It makes it remarkably simple to do. 500 million divided by 100,000, 5,000 contracts, sell them. Yes? Just yeah, close to par. Yeah, let's say close to par. We're waving hands at it. Okay? Close enough. So let's say that we do that. Rates go up, and suppose that rates go up by 1%, and suppose we using this seven modified duration number. So what happens to the value of the bonds? Yeah, how much? $35 million? Okay, so the value of the balance bonds drops by $35 million. And what happens in the futures? Gain $35 million. So it exactly offsets. And after, um, after the two months, uh, you reverse out. 
So you're left with a portfolio that's worth $500 million. This hedge worked really well. Now, you know, there was other possibilities here that you know, we could have just sold the bond, right? Just dump the bonds and invested in what money market or something like that for two months and then went back and reinvested in the bond. But what's the problem there? Transaction costs? Yeah, big transaction costs. Whereas this was real easy to do in a day. And the same thing with stocks, that uh, you've got a portfolio of $500 million in stocks, and you think the market's going to be soft or negative in the next couple of months. So what do you do? You can just sell the stocks, right? You think the market's going to go down, the first reaction is, well, we better sell. Well, if you're in the stocks for the long run, then uh, to sell those stocks and then have to buy them all back up, in two months, which is a massive transaction going to be just like burning money to do that. So you want to put the short-term hedge on, go to the futures market. And what do you do? You buy or sell the S&P 500. So the price goes down, then you're going to make some money. And your portfolio is protected. So for short-term hedges like this, um, this works really well. Now, suppose the rates actually, instead of going up, they went down. So they go down by, uh, they go down by 1%. What happens in the futures market? It's $35 million. Now, let me tell you what you want to avoid. Okay? You want to avoid a situation where your superior comes into your office and, and start screaming, uh, you lost $35 million you begin with on derivatives. Um, you know, you can take your Duke education and fund it and, uh, and maybe rail on me too. Uh, <laughs> that Bozo Harvey doesn't know anything. Uh, these futures are risky. I knew it. I knew it. Uh, you're fired. So what's the mistake that this person is making? It's like in the total value picture, you're, you're basically uh, eating. Okay? Because the, if the rates went down, then the value of the portfolio went up to 535. Nevertheless, you know, $35 million in cash has been transferred out of your account. So what's really important, if you're setting up a hedge, doing a hedge, like for real, that the people above you have to understand exactly what's going on. So you put the two scenarios down. So, well, if rates go up by 1%, then this is going to happen. If rates go down by 1%, this is what's going to happen. Make sure they're comfortable, because they might not have uh, been through and had a lot of experience with, with hedging, right? especially that's your first job to look at this question to set up the hedge. It's like maybe they're, you know, asking you to do it because they don't have to do it. Okay, you come from Duke MBA, you should be able to do it. Like after the first course in finance, you should be able to do this. That's why I said that at the beginning of the, the, the course, I said that I want you to take some stuff away that you can actually use. And there's no small transaction either. So, but the people that are doing this must be aware of the two sides. And actually, what I would do is I would say to them, I've got two ways of doing this hedge. There's two ways. Way number one involves an option. <coughs> and what kind of option? What option? It's going to cost this much. And if rates go up, then it's going to cover us. If rates go down, we're going to make some money. Way number two doesn't cost anything. And we basically lock in the $500 million for two months. What do you want? So put it, put it to them. So these are the possibilities. But it's critically important that you detail the scenarios. And it seems like a simple lesson, uh, but it's a lesson that people forget even at the very highest levels. Thank <laughs> you.
And actually, uh, it's interesting, there's this really uh, big case uh, going on. Um, the uh, Metalla Jellishop uh, case, I'm not sure about it, um, where uh, it's a complicated case, and I'd love to talk about it for a whole lecture, because um, it involves a massive, a massive loss. And just to sketch the situation, uh, this is a, a refining company <coughs> that sells, let's say, gasoline to gas stations. <coughs> so you buy crude oil, refine it to gasoline, and sell it to gas stations. And they sell up to 10 years in advance for delivery. So it's like forward contracts up to 10 years in advance. <coughs> we'll deliver 5,000 gallons of gasoline in March 1999 at this price. What is the risk that they face? Price oil goes up. They are killed, right? Because they've got to buy the crude oil at a high price, refine it, which is costly, and then sell it at potentially a really low price that they contracted it, you know, up to 10 years in advance. They cannot survive um, without doing a hedge. So, um, you know, they kind of realize that, uh, or at least <laughs> people realize that. So what would be the, uh, the futures uh, trade that you would ever take? Buy crude oil. So if the price goes up, then money is being transferred into your account. So that's exactly what they did. And when they did that, um, in Basically, what happened is the price of crude oil started to fall. <coughs> fall and fall. And it turns out that money's being transferred out in a big way to the tune of, I think it was like $1.4 billion. So uh, basically, uh, the board of directors sees this and says, you know, People are, are, are killing us. You know, the firm as a whole doesn't have $1.4 billion cash to, to actually do this. So they reversed out. They ordered a reverse out of all the contracts. And they took this loss of uh, $1.4 billion. And they fired all of the, uh, the people doing the hedging. Okay. And then they basically, uh, they had no hedge going on. Right. <laughs> price of oil actually went back up. So they wouldn't have lost everything back. Right. Now they're probably thinking about hedging again. Right. You can see if you get into this loop that uh, you could really get into trouble. So, um, so basically, what these traders did, uh, the U.S. operation, was the correct thing in terms of uh, hedge. It turns out that they made some some very bad mistakes on the side. Of really bad mistakes. So it turns out that uh, the problem was, uh, well, actually, let's go to the second example. This is a similar, uh, similar point. So the second example is a textbook example. I mean uh, by that uh, is that I pulled this out of a textbook, a famous textbook, okay? But I'm not giving you execution. Okay? So this is uh, the scenario. Was there a question? A question? Just kind of talking through that example, um, saying it shouldn't have sold out because they still have agreed upon price to sell gasoline you know, in the future. Right. So was it more of a cash flow thing? Yeah, well, it was because you think about it, uh, the price goes down, which means that they're uh, basically getting the oil, the crude, really cheap, and they're selling at a higher price. They're just being compensated for that. It's exactly, you know, the farmer example of went through, right? Um, the problem was a, a cash flow situation that they hadn't actually planned on anything, anything like this, and, uh, and the banks were unwilling, or they didn't understand what was happening. It turned out it's a German firm, and 50% of the board of directors was like off one bank, and they should have really figured out what was going on. But the problem was not the kind of, the, the idea that it was, was sound. The problem was, how they actually uh, execute it. Okay. And, uh, but let's do this example because it's kind of like a revealing example for execution. 
So this is a more complicated example. The bank is going to issue 100 million in CDs. They're one-year CDs. Okay, so one year to maturity, and uh, they're going to issue three months from now, and they're concerned with rising interest rates. Does that make sense? Yes. Because the rate that they pay on the CDs is really the bank's cost of funds. So the people give them money, and they have to pay for it with the CD rate. If the rate goes up, that's definitely bad news for them. The CD rate today is 9%. And what they actually do is uh, decide to hit with the Treasury bill futures. It's a 90-day Treasury bill. And um, they, uh, they've got 100 million they're going to issue in three months. So they take uh, 100 contracts. The Treasury bill, like the Euro dollar, is a, a $1 million contract. And the price, um, if we calculate the price using the banker's discount formula for that is 97977 And they're selling. Okay, does it make sense to sell? Yes. Because if the CD rate goes up, that's a bad scenario for them. So they need something to pay off when rates go up or prices go down. The only thing that's going to pay off when prices go down is a short position. Okay, so they're going to sell 100 uh, contracts um, of the Treasury bill, and the price is 90, 97 million. Basically. So basically, uh, it looks good to start with. And what I do in these examples is to simplify them by assuming nothing happens between January 14th and April 5th. There's no settling up every day because the price is fixed every single day until the very last day. I mean, just to, to simplify things. So everything remains, the treasure bill remains at the 8% discount rate. The price is 97, 977 until the very last day. And then the interest rate increases on the Treasury bill from 8 to 10. Okay. Now it turns out the CD rate also increases, and we have to issue the CDs at 10%. The rate we wanted to lock was 9%. So the extra annual interest cost is uh, $1 million. Right? Issue at 9 versus 8 is going to cost you an extra million dollars. So really our loss um, in having to finance at 10% um, at, at versus 9 is $1 million. That's easy. The futures, the price drops, which is good. It's exactly what we wanted to happen. The price drops from 97,977 to 97,472. Take the difference, and that's what's going to be transferred into our account. And we're going to reverse out immediately. So we're out. Okay? And it turns out that $505,000 transferred into our account. So you look at this hedge, and as I say, this is uh, presented in this textbook as, uh, as a pretty good hedge. Because we lost a million dollars in terms of the opportunity for the CD. We gained uh, more than half back on the hedge. And one thing that you'll notice in the lecture notes is that uh, one type of extra risk that you bear is when you've got something to hedge and you don't have the exact same instrument to hedge it with. So in our first example, we had exactly the same thing in the bond market um, in our portfolio that we had in the futures market. Here, we got a CD that we're hedging with a treasury bill. Those things are different. So we're not going to move one to one. We're not going to see, and in general, Okay, in general, we're not going to see perfect hedges anywhere. Okay, because it's almost always the case that we're hedging with something that's different than what we're holding. In this case, as I said, the CD is different than a treasury bill. And uh, so, you know, we got half of it. The question is, like, there's multiple things that went wrong in this hedge. We got to figure out what they are. The 
first thing. Would you have hedged with a treasury bill? <coughs> offshore, but um, you know, I don't really care. 99% correlated with U.S. CDs. So that's the first mistake. Then there's a second, uh, far more serious mistake. sensitivity here. So the correct way to do this is just like we did for the futures, or the, uh, the options. Calculate the loss for 1% movement rates, and in this case, it would be a million dollars for the CD. And match that with the gain for a 1% movement in the treasury bill. What happens if the treasury bill goes from 8% to 9%? How much do you gain? You got the calculation for 8 to 10. It's like half of that, right? About $250,000. So we need to multiply that by the number of contracts to get it to equal a million dollars. So how many contracts do we need? It's a real simple calculation if you just look at the ratios of the modified durations. One modified duration is one, the other is 0.25. Divide the two, you get four. So in this particular situation, we were actually lucky. We were lucky that we didn't lose $750,000. It just so happened to play in our favor that the rate went from eight to 10. That if the CD rate and the T-bill rate had moved one for one, then the rate would have gone from eight to nine. The gain in the futures would have been $250,000. It would have been short seven hundred dollars The correct way to do this one is to sell 400 treasury bills in the futures. If we do that, then um, in this particular example, we've got cash flow coming in of $2 million. The one million of that covers our loss, and the other million is just pure luck. So, and as I said, that this is a, a textbook example that I should, uh, I should note that they do not mention that this is, um, this is a bad thing. This is presented as a model page. So this is why it's difficult to uh, teach finance from a textbook. This is not from the textbooks I recommend. Um, so this is a, a remarkably uh, bad hedge. Why would, they, why would they do that? Why would they recommend that? Well, what do you think? It's obvious that the person writing it doesn't understand uh, anything about hedging. <laughs> Or conversely, wouldn't you kind of want to just just get rid of maybe half your risk? Oh, totally different. 
Right? Right. You want to lay off half your risk, then you would do how many contracts? Or two, but I take a quarter of your risk, or whatever. You might not want to do Absolutely. 100%. You want to lay off a quarter? That's fine. But tell me that's what you're doing. Right. <laughs> yeah, maybe the author of the book has figured that out and uh, has revised it or something. Oh, what I meant was to lay off a quarter of the rest. Yeah. That's not the way it's presented. Uh, it's set it up. When you said, like, hedge by risk, it means 100%. Okay. Um, we got three minutes. Uh, we might be able to get through the, uh, the second example. <laughs> Uh, let's go through this. Uh, pension fund managers expecting to receive five million in three months. Concerned about falling interest rates, so you've got some money to invest here. This is a different scenario. Money to invest, and if the rate falls, that's bad news. So, in this case, uh, the bad scenario is falling interest rates or rising prices. So the hedge. Do you go long or short? You go long. So you benefit from the rising prices. So uh, expecting to receive five million in three months, concerned about falling yields, and uh, decides to go long 50 T-bond futures contracts. And the long-term rate here is 10.5%, 10.25% to start. They go long. Uh, 50 contracts in the June Treasury bond, and it turns out the price of the bond in this example is $76, point, or 0.76 for a dollar, and the total value of the underlying is $3.815 million. And then the rates fall, which is the bad scenario, to go from 10.25 to 9.5. So that means there's an opportunity lost in the investment of 0.75%, uh, okay, $37,000. It turns out that the bond price goes from 76 to 80, which is good news for us because we're long. So the value goes from 3.8 million to 400,000, or 4, 4 million. So we have a profit on the right hand side and a loss on the left, which is exactly what we want. Turns out the profit is 184,000, and that appears to greatly exceed the loss. But the textbook's smart enough to figure out that this is an opportunity loss for every year. Okay, so you have to take the present value of 37,500 for the life of the investment, and they actually do that. And so <coughs> footnote, and it turns out the present value is 315,000. So the total opportunity loss from the rates dropping to 9.5 is 315,000. The total gain in the futures is 184,000. Again, this is painted as the, uh, the ideal or recommended way to do this hedge. Now this, to me, is obviously problematic because you only get half of what you lost. And what's going on? What's the main mistake here? Let's go at the top. You're going to have 50 or $5 million to invest. Okay. And if this is exactly the same, you're going to put it in a treasury bond, it's the exact same sensitivity to interest rates as what we've got in the T-bond futures. What you want to do is to buy $5 million worth of the bond. And how much do you buy here? Buy 3.8 million. So this, this person has made the most basic mistake in finance to confuse the par value of the bond with the market value. And it turns out in this case, it is a huge mistake. Because $76 is not $100. So we always use the value of the bond. We calculate our modified duration not off $5 million face value. We calculate it off 
to $3.8 million market value. So I, in, in the note, I call this a double naive hedge. <laughs> so you kind of ignore the differences in volatility, and then you, you ignore the difference between the market value and the face value of a bond. So two critical errors. So you can see why I use this textbook example. Okay, I think it's a good example of how not to hedge. Okay, so go through that, make sure you understand, and um, we'll start on optimal portfolio control next lecture.